here. Uh, none of these uh, fellows agree with me on design, but they're at least um, reasonably polite, <laughs> and that's not always the case. Um, the book was also reviewed in, in the journal Trends in Ecology and Evolution, entitled The Blind Biochemist. I'm not sure who they were talking about there. Um, but anyway, it was, it was reviewed by a man named, oh, Tom Cavalier-Smith, who is a prominent evolutionary bi biologist. And he begins, his opening sentence is, what is sad about this book is that the author thinks he has something new to say and is contributing to science. So I'm a little bit dumb uh, to start off. But, but by the end, he's, he's rethought his position. And he says, are these various omissions merely through ignorance or by deliberate intent? Because as a Catholic, he prefers the illusion of an intelligent biochemist creator to mutations and the blind gropings of macromolecules. So uh, towards the end, he talks himself into to thinking that I'm, I'm perhaps a little dishonest because of my religious uh, background. And in between those two sentences, he uses adjectives such as anti-scientific, worthless, deceitful, intellectually shallow, ignorant and blissfully unaware. Um, so this is to give you the idea that he seems not to like the book. <laughs> Can't please everybody. Nonetheless, he, he also said some other things which were of interest to me. He said that in the book there are relatively few factual errors. In fact, there are, as far as I know, no factual errors in my descriptions of the biochemical systems. And he also says, for none of the cases mentioned by Behe is there yet a comprehensive and detailed explanation of the probable steps in the evolution of the observed complexity. The problems have indeed been sorely neglected. Well, heck, you know. Uh, so that's just to show you that some people really very strongly disagree with the idea of design. But nonetheless, they um, agree that uh, even the, the most uh, emotional ones agree that uh, these things continue to be unexplained and are, are very, very much challenges. There's only been one person I've known of that says that something I've described is actually on its way to being explained. And that's a, a man named Russell Doolittle, uh, who's a professor of biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. I wrote in the book uh, a section on blood, the blood clotting cascade. Uh, when you cut yourself, you nick yourself shaving or something, the, a little bit of blood trickles out and it eventually congeals and heals over. It looks pretty simple. And here's a little electron micrograph of, of red blood cells in a, in a uh, blood clot, in the fibrin meshwork clot. It looks pretty simple, but biochemical investigation has shown in the past several decades that uh, it's a very complex affair. Uh, this is fibrinogen, which is the stuff of the clot itself. And it's controlled by all these very, very many different factors. Uh, several dozen or so are involved in it. And I, I um, discussed in the book, I likened it to a Rube Goldberg machine, uh, where one thing acts on the next, and this cork goes up and punctures this glass of beer, which intoxicates the bird, and the bird falls here and flips over. And I noted that you while know, Rube Goldberg systems, yes, they're funny and they're silly, but they're also irreducibly complex, and they're intelligently designed. And if you take away any one of these parts, you're not going to get your neck scratched while you're talking to a lady. <coughs> and um, I think this made Russell Doolittle mad because he liked to use, he also likes Rube Goldberg and um, uses a Rube Goldberg analogy uh, in explaining the, the blood clotting system. But, but uh, he thinks that because it's, there are so many different parts that, uh, that God would not have made something that way. And that's pretty much a direct quote. But uh, in, a, in an article in, in a magazine called Boston Review, uh, about a dozen different people uh, were called and asked to write comments on my book. And Russell Doolittle uh, commented uh, on it too. And he concluded uh, 
by saying this. He said, recently, the gene for plasminogen, which is a protein which kind of uh, breaks up blood clots, was knocked out of mice. That means it was, uh, it was turned off, essentially. And predictably, those mice had thrombotic complications because fibrin clots could not be cleared away. Not long after that, the same workers knocked out the gene for fibrinogen in another line of mice. That's actually the clotting material. Again, predictably, these mice were ailing, although in this case, hemorrhage was the problem. And what do you think happened when those two lines of mice were crossed, interbred? For all practical purposes, the mice lacking both genes were normal. Contrary to claims about irreducible complexity, the entire ensemble of proteins is not needed. Music and harmony can arise from a smaller orchestra. So Doolittle was saying that when you knock out these two genes separately and then recombine them, you can actually get a biochemical, a functioning blood clotting uh, pathway. And I would disagree that that actually says, uh, uh, addresses the question of, of irreducible complexity directly. But I guess the main point, though, is that Russell Doolittle was wrong. He misread the paper in which this was discussed. And here's, a, uh, here's the paper uh, which was published in Cell a year or so ago. Loss of, loss of fibrinogen rescues mice from the pleiotropic effects of plasminogen deficiency. And here's the, a normal mouse. And here's a fibrinogen deficient mouse. And here's a plasminogen deficient mouse. You can see it's a runt. But if you knock out both of them, you have a normal sized mouse. And Russell Doolittle looked at this and thought that this mouse had been turned into a normal mouse. But if you read it carefully, you see that it says mice deficient in plasminogen and fibrinogen are phenotypically indistinguishable, that is more or less the same, as fibrinogen deficient mice. What does that mean in, in English? Essentially, they're, they're missing the clotting material, which means they can't form clots, they hemorrhage, they die, if the females die when they become pregnant, and they are not happy campers. Um, they do not have this, uh, these other problems that plasminogen deficient mice have. And the explanation for that is, is pretty straightforward, I think. Sometimes you form clots in the wrong place, and plasminogen will take care of it. It's like a, a garbage disposal that takes care of, of garbage. But if you don't have fibrinogen, then you don't make any garbage in the first place, so you don't need the garbage disposal. It's, it's kind of that simple. And I, I had a correspondence with Russell Doolittle, and he kind of graciously admitted that he had misread the paper. The point here, though, is not that somebody can misread a, a paper. Certainly, I do it all the time. The point is that this was put up as the latest result bearing on the question of whether blood clotting could evolve in a Darwinian manner. And I hope you agree with me that it does not show what it was thought to show. And beyond that, Russell Doolittle is, is perhaps, is certainly one of the top people involved in blood clotting research. He did his doctoral work in 1959 on comparative aspects of blood clotting from different species, very much interested in its evolution. And uh, perhaps you can see from this that even Russell Doolittle does not know how blood clotting could have been put together in a Darwinian fashion. And if Russell Doolittle does not know, uh, nobody knows. And gee, I've got all these transparencies in about a minute or so uh, to talk about them. So let me just uh, give you perhaps the best the most interesting one, um, from my point of view at least. Um, in that same symposium in Boston Review, the main review was written by a, an evolutionary biologist by the name of Alan Orr at the University of Rochester, I believe. And he raised a, a very interesting uh, question, uh, a philosophical question about the conclusion of design. He said that We know that there are people who make things like mousetraps. I'm not being facetious here. I'm utterly serious. When choosing between the design and Darwinian hypotheses, 
we find design plausible for mousetraps only because we have independent knowledge that there are creatures called humans who construct all variety of mechanical contraptions. If we didn't, the existence of mousetraps would pose a legitimate scientific problem. So this is kind of a, a, an interesting philosophical point. He's saying that we know there are humans, we know they make mousetraps, we know they can make jungle traps. We do not know that humans can make blood clotting systems and so on and so forth. So we cannot conclude design, he asserts, because we don't know of any, anything uh, presumably non-human that would have put such a thing together. It's an interesting point, but I, I disagree with him. And not only do I disagree with him, but the federal government disagrees uh, with him. It must make him feel very bad. Uh, maybe not. Um, for a long time, the federal government supported something called the SETI program, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they spent about 50 million of your tax dollars on this program, in which radio telescopes are put up and they scan the skies looking for radio waves, radio messages that might have been sent from uh, alien civilizations. And they have to distinguish them from the background radio noise of space. Those scientists involved in, those, in that program are confident that they can detect an intelligently designed radio signal and distinguish it from, like I said, the random noise even though they have never seen aliens sending radio messages, even though we do not know there are such things as aliens uh, existing. Nonetheless, they think that within the structure of the thing itself, within the structure of the radio message, they can come to a firm conclusion of design. And I think we can at least e extend that reasoning, I, I, I like to think, to biochemical systems. Even though we have not seen anybody designing such things, just simply from the structure of the systems themselves, I think we can come to a reasonable conclusion of design. And I wish I had more time to, to chat with you, but uh, I'll have to defer to my co-panelists. Thank you. begin by confessing that I'm also an admitted Christian. I've even been seen going into churches and even occasionally teaching Sunday school. Um, I also had an extensive interest in evolution during my undergraduate years and have kept a background eye on it uh, in the years since then. I mentioned that background to make it clear that I have no fundamental uh, worldview dis uh, disagreements with Dr. Behe, but that it's with some of the points of the arguments about the biochemistry that I have some differences. Uh, Professor Behe's arguments can be reduced to, I think, four major points. That some biological systems are irreducibly complex. That there are no Darwinian explanations for irreducibly complex systems. That Darwinian explanations cannot be given for irreducibly complex systems. And that design is a better explanation for such systems. Um, I was going to read the definition of irreducibly complex, but I think Professor Behe has made it clear enough. But a biologist looking at that set of characters would not probably have chosen those words. They probably would have described such systems as non-redundant. And if we use the term non-redundant to describe them, it immediately draws our attention to a second class of systems, which are redundant systems. And in fact, in biology and in biochemistry, there are a wide array of redundant systems. The redundancy of biological systems is one of the major difficulties that plagues biochemists in analyzing it. Uh, Professor Behe showed us some of the transgenic mice that uh, Dr. Doolittle referred to. And one of the recurrent major frustrations in transgenic mice is that one studies a phenotype in a single cell and puts it into the mouse, and the phenotype goes away. The systems are so redundant that trying to isolate an effect is quite difficult. And I would like to suggest that if we focus on redundant systems in addition to non-redundant or irreducibly complex ones, that the problem of Darwinian explanations is rather different. That in a redundant system, there is room for fiddling around, for trying out novelties, for adding duplicate copies of genes, and letting things wobble a bit until something new comes out. And so by focusing 
first and solely on the irreducibly complex or non-redundant aspect of, of biological systems, I think we've lost an avenue of explanation that might have been fruitful. Um, there'll be more along that line in a little bit. Uh, the second point of Professor Behe is that there are no Darwinian explanations for irreducibly complex systems. And I will say here that as far as I know, I agree. Uh, uh, Cavalier Smith knows a lot more than I do about the current state of evolutionary biology, and he doesn't know of any, so I'm quite willing to, to concede this. But I um, draw a different uh, conclusion from this than Professor Behe does. I have lived now since 1981 in a department of biochemists, although I am by training and, and current profession of cell biologists. I sometimes describe this as being a little bit like being a Lutheran in a Jesuit seminary. Um, <laughs> Um, I love my colleagues. They're amazing people. They know things about atoms and enzyme mechanisms and the pathways of Arabinus that I will never know. They are very interesting people and very smart and very knowledgeable. But most of them don't care about evolution. Um, many of them don't know when the dinosaurs died out. Um, some of them don't know why sea urchins are closer to us than fruit flies. Um, they don't know how old the eukaryotic cell is. These are extremely basic facts of evolution, of descriptive evolution, uh, which most of my colleagues don't even know that much about evolution. They know a great deal about many other things, but they're not very interested in evolution. And so I think if we start with a set of biochemists who has an interest in biolution, we're dealing, first of all, with a fairly small set. Um, secondly, uh, the support for evolutionary studies is very poor. Um, in general, the funding agencies do not seem to find those kinds of studies of particular interest, and people whose initial interests focus on two or three areas, and one of them is evolutionary, will often find that they cannot get the m money needed to do experiments to do evolutionary studies. They're not seen as useful, for one thing. If I have a choice between something that's clearly related to cancer and something that tells me how the psyllium evolved, many funding agencies want to have the short-term payoff first. The third reason I think that there are no ex explanations at present is the difficulty of studying these things goes up as the size goes down. When you want to study how the bones of the inner ear evolve from the jaw bones of a fish, you're dealing with objects that are visible either to the naked eye or to a dissecting scope. As we start to get down into the systems that Professor Behe is pointing at, we are going down by orders of magnitude. And with each order of magnitude in size, you get smaller. You get order or more, more than orders of magnitude increase in difficulty in studying them. After I've isolated a cilium from, say, Chlamydomonas, I cannot instantly assume I can go through the same procedure again when I want to isolate that cilium from Paramecium, even though they're both microorganisms. I, one of my graduate students isolated something called a clathrin-coated vesicle from Chlamydomonas precisely because we had some evolutionary questions. It took her longer to isolate it from that second organism than the original investigators had taken to isolate it the first time because of the differences in one system to another simply mean you can't assume uh, it'll be easier each time. Uh, so the difficulties are quite substantial. And finally, bi biochemists with an interest in evolution face a problem that paleontologists do not. Biochemists have no fossils. When I want to look at the bones of the inner ear and compare them to the bones of the jaw of, the jaw of a fish, there are actual fossils out there of different ages that were there at one time in history. Biochemists work from living organisms, from what is around today. And although we talk about some organisms as being living fossils, I think the odds of the organisms that are needed to study these kinds of questions still being alive are fairly small. It's or at least, I, I don't think that there's a, a claim that anyone can point to a reasonable subset that would satisfy that. So I myself don't find it that surprising that even scientists who have an interest in evolution um, may nonetheless choose to pursue other topics because I was one of those myself as an undergraduate. I had several areas of interest that were about equal in weight, and I was human. I picked the one where I thought I could progress more quickly. Um, the third point that uh, Professor Behe would like to make is that Darwinian explanations cannot be given for irreducibly complex systems. And he repeats that we cannot give them a number of places in the book. Um, but. But here I have trouble. I'm trying to figure out what this cannot be given might mean. Is it first that we can't see how to do it right now? Um, that's a, a statement about our current inability or our current lack of knowledge. And I'm reminded of the comment made by Lord Kelvin during the 19th century that he gave us an example to the absolute limits of science that we will never know the chemical composition of the sun. And it's a few years later that helium was discovered in the sun um, by spectroscopic properties. Uh, I, as a scientist, am very reluctant to say what we cannot do in 10 or 50 years. Or is it the stronger claim that it is intrinsically impossible to give such explanations? 
but I don't see how we can know that it is intrinsically impossible to give such explanations. And, and although I have tried several times to extract that from Professor Behe's arguments, I'm still at a loss to see how we can know that it's intrinsically impossible. I find it interesting that Professor Behe does go over a number of failed explanations for evolutionary systems in his book and, and shows their weaknesses quite, quite reasonably. And yet he neglected the one discussion of the evolution of life that I myself have found most interesting. Since he doesn't mention it in his book, I'll give you the title now. It's called Seven Clues to the Origin of Life. It's by a, a scientist called Karen Smith. And this is a, an interesting book for several reasons. Karen Smith is an eminent microbiologist, an extremely well-respected scientist, and a very creative one. Secondly, he faces full frontally the difficulties of the kind of prebiotic soup models of uh, origins of life. He does not burke them at all. He faces them head on and says, that way won't work. And he then goes on to say, what might a kind of an explanation look like? And he proposes, the, uh, he proposes two analogies that I think might be fruitful to be pursued. Um, one is the idea of a scaffolding. That is, if we come across a place in a northern European dig and we discover a stone arch that's in suspended in air like this, um, we might wonder how on earth could an arch like that come to be up in the air. Yet if we'd come while it was being built, we would have seen underneath it lots of intricate scaffolding that held the, held the stones in place until the keystone was put in. And then once the keystone is put in, you can take the scaffolding away. So that scaffolding that is taken away afterwards is one kind of an explanation for systems that now are, in fact, irreducibly complex. The final archway with its keystone is irreducibly complex now, but if there were scaffolding present during its building, it was not irreducibly complex in the interim. The second metaphor he uses is, or, or analogy he uses, is that we ought to be aware that what we look at now, today, may be quite different from what began back here. And the uh, metaphor he uses is of a rope that starts off being pure hemp over here, and you braid in some cotton along the way here, and by this end of the rope, you've got a pure cotton rope. And what he's trying to point to here is that there might be models that could generate self-replicating systems, uh, self-organizing systems back in, say, a steam vent on the bottom of the ocean um, that might not look anything like a living system today, but to which, bit by bit, components could be added that resemble our current one, and the other ones get sort of lost as they get less needed, until by the time you get here, you now have a system that has all of our components. I, I recommend the book to you. I can't do justice in 10 minutes, but I think it is pointing in a plausible direction for a, a, an explanation. Um, and finally, Professor Bay would like to say that design is a better explanation. But I'm a bit puzzled as to what kind of an explanation it can be. If we don't have the traits of the designer, I don't see what kind of predictive power it can be to think that something is designed. Professor Behe has pointed this out in, in the quote he gave us. In his book, he also mentions the idea that if we landed on a planet and we saw buildings standing around, we wouldn't need to know that there were intelligent aliens to deduce that there were some because there were the buildings. Um, but that's because the buildings are similar enough to the kinds of things we make that we can in interpret them. I don't begin to know what kind of a designer to think of that makes centrioles. Um, and, and I don't think there's any place within science by which we could deduce the properties of such a designer. So this doesn't seem to me to be an explanation that explains something. I'd like to close by saying that personally, I myself think that it is, it is po quite possible, and even perhaps likely, that the origins of these structures and the origins of cells are, are unknowable that because of their size, because of the lost intermediates, because of the difficulty of studying them, it may mean that we cannot know some of these things, and that this is comparable to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where certain things cannot be known with greater than a certain amount of precision. And if this is the case, we need to learn to live with that rather than trying to shoehorn it into some other explanation. I come from a tradition that has the concept of mystery, that there are some theological concepts that are mysteries. You can, you can inquire, you can probe as deeply as you wish to, but at the end there will be a profundity to it that you cannot push past, you can only experience. And as a scientist, it doesn't trouble me at all that there may be some irreducible mysteries in the physical world as well that are themselves perhaps a reflection of their creator who's left a fingerprint uh, to mark them. Thank you very much.
unlike our previous two speakers, I'm not a scientist. I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> um, I'm a philosopher, historian, and more recently a rhetorician of science. That is someone who's interested not just in the internal logic of scientific arguments, but in how they fare over fairly long periods of time with the audiences, both professional and public, to which they're addressed. In particular, I'm a philosopher and rhetorician of evolutionary biology, and especially the Darwinian research tradition in evolutionary biology. Uh, my first uh, point uh, uh, in relation to Dr. Behe is not about his intentions with respect to standard creationist arguments or his own religious beliefs or anything like that, but what uh, his argument will be like when it's received into a discursively thick context that has already been constructed around about 25 or 30 years of what could be called second wave American creationism. Uh, the way these arguments go um, is like this. Uh, <clears throat> the creationist asks the Darwinian to come up with a selectionist argument for some phenomenon. When no detailed uh, argument uh, by some criterion uh, that um, sometimes is stated, sometimes not, uh, is when no explanation is forthcoming, sometimes Darwinians are dumb enough to profess faith that eventually a Darwinian will be argument for something currently explained. And sometimes they're really dumb because that they say the reason for that is that they have to be committed to the universal explanatory power of Darwinism in order to keep committed to philosophical naturalism or materialism. Well, at that point, I think the creationists can usually jump pretty easily um, because uh, the virtues that are being exhibited there are not scientific virtues. They are virtues that come from an antecedent commitment to an ideological worldview. Now, that's the way these things have always worked in the past, at least the ones that have, uh, where the creationists have won. And you'd be surprised that I've watched 20 or 30 of these things either in person or on video or, and this is the first one I've ever been in. Um, <laughs> although I guess it's, it's a, not really one. Um, uh, you'd be surprised the creationists very often win because of this um, um, antecedent commitment to it's got to be Darwinian. Now, I, I think that over years, uh, um, these arguments have been getting better. Um, Philip Johnson's arguments are a lot better than Dwayne Gish's. And to tell you the truth, even I don't know whether uh, Michael Behe wants his argument to be put into this context, but it's certainly going to be received into it. And from that point of view, it seems to me that he does an awful lot better so that they're, they're getting um, better over time. The way this goes is that you have the property of com uh, irreducible complexity, and then like the character in the movie, uh, Behe says to the Darwinian, show me the money. <laughs> Give me a selectionist explanation of <clears throat> um, bacterial flagellum, signal transduction at membranes, transport across membranes within cells, blood clotting, origin and regulation of metabolism. And as you've heard today, that's really difficult to do uh, so far. So the question is, what, what can we uh, infer from that? Um, the idea is, um, is that uh, a Darwinian um, uh, argument would be impossible, I think in the strong sense that Dr. Fulton was talking about, because the assumption here was that Darwinianism builds up traits gradually, bit by bit, but only traits get fixed in a population with respect to current utility. But with respect to these complex systems, um, <clears throat> the, the, the system already has to be up and running or there would be no selective value at all. There's one way of putting that, I think. Um, Then he says, citing the, uh, the epistemic respectability, uh, responsibility of scientists to infer to the best explanation from the available evidence, Behe concludes that intentional design is the best explanation of that subset of biological systems that are irreducibly complex. He also avoids overreaching, like many creationists have, um, b um, by, uh, not by saying that design is the only possible explanation, but given the phenomenon the best explanation we can currently get. Nor does he overplay his hand by arguing that all biological systems are, biochemical systems are irreducibly complex, or by saying anything more about the designer than that it's an intentional agent. He's pretty neutral about his theology. Now, <clears throat> my, my point is that very many cre uh, people who, uh, who receive this argument uh, are going to be, if they look at it carefully, fairly disappointed. Um, in, <clears throat> for instance, uh, Behe concedes that at the um, <clears throat> level uh, that we all the macro evolution, uh, macro level that we live in, um, 
He says uh, in the book, I find the idea of common descent that all ancestors, our organisms share a common ancestor fairly convincing. I think evolutionary biologists have contributed enormously to our understanding of the world. Although Darwin's mechanism, natural selection, working on variation might explain many things, I don't think it explains molecular life. Now, it probably explains a lot, because he even says that some um, systems, the ones uh, that um, at the molecular level could be explained this way. Uh, but that leaves open, with, to respect to the people that consume this, the following uh, problem. That is, the standard argument against Darwinism, why the motive is for trying to get rid of it, uh, is that it seems to be inconsistent with God's goodness, since the means by which it creates is wasteful, bloody, violent, and cruel, and pretty disheartening, as well as contradictory to the um, <coughs> doctrine of providential care, since the mechanism of evolution involved in natural selection cannot be said to be going anywhere, thereby making it impossible to compensate for all the violence and chance by saying that this is facilitating a purposive end that will make it all worthwhile. Now, earlier scientific arguments, uh, creationist arguments may not as be scientific as Behe's, but in their wholesale denial of Darwinism at the organismic species and phylogenetic levels, they were at least not open to this objection. They were going to deny the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel. Technically speaking, Behe's uh, is more respectable but therefore less useful for those audiences. Now, technically speaking, this is not his problem. He's not a theologian, but it may be a problem for his customers who could be looking for something a bit more comforting. Um, <clears throat> it also raises theological questions, like if he could make the, why didn't he do the whole job? <laughs> but, <laughs> now, to make my second point, I, I want to say that, um, as a historian of Darwinism or a historian of science, you see that at the, uh, um, I referred at the beginning to the Darwinian research tradition. I did so because on purely historical grounds, I believe that natural selection, the core idea of the Darwinian research tradition, is until it's further specified in terms of mechanisms, mathematics, experimentally testable models, is simply the name for a pre-theoretical idea. It's not a scientific theory. The idea, which can be intuitively grasp without any formalism at all is roughly that members of a population vary, that organisms carry variant traits that enable them to do better metabolically and reproductively in a given environment, that other members of the population that don't possess that various variant trait will, if those traits are heritable, slowly shift the composition of the population toward the helpful variant trait and away from those that aren't helpful. Until 1859, from 1859 till now, this simple idea so simple that Thomas Huxley, Darwin's champion, when on hearing it for the first time, reproached himself for being so stupid as not to have thought of it himself, has been articulated into a succession of genuine theories, Darwinian, earlier Darwinian theories being driven out by later ones when the earlier ones proved themselves unable to solve problems that arise within the domain of the research of tradition, later ones being installed in their place because they do offer solutions to those problems. Darwin's Darwinism, for instance, was pretty good at explaining adaptation, but absolutely miserable at explaining speciation. So miserable, in fact, that by the turn of the century, the whole Darwinian tradition almost collapsed because a counter uh, uh, idea was found, one-shot macro mutations, that uh, looked for a bit like, and that's how genetics actually got involved in the act originally. 